Thanks, Lizzie. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, uh, yeah, welcome to tonight's session. Um, I'm sure everyone's a little bit um, wet and bedraggled after today's weather. Um, I'm guessing most of us have been outside and I'm a part of that, with my hair being soaking wet. Third outfit of the day, of the day now. Um, yeah, so um, I'll just quickly introduce myself then and then we'll get into the into the topic. So, um, yeah, my name's Rachel and um, my organisation is called EDGE and uh, we're not for profit and we do a combination really of um, uh, supporting setup and uh, um, expansion of market gardens. Um, everything we do is organic. Uh, all ourselves regen um, because our main focus is always about building soil. Um, and uh, we run courses and we um, design spaces for food and for biodiversity. Um, I'm a landscape architect um, and uh, I've also studied urban design and I guess um, that sort of led to my interest in, in urban food production um, and, and it might be a bit of an odd one for some of you coming here as organic growers and probably used to acres and acres worth of space and, and fields. Um, so hopefully I can kind of persuade you, maybe gently persuade you that urban food production is certainly part of our future food um, solution. Um, and I think really for me, the interest came because it's fine while we've got lots of land, but actually there's lots of more people now living in towns and cities um, and access to fresh and healthy food isn't always easy in a town or a city. Um, so I kind of saw it as a bit of a challenge, really, to really delve into urban food production and learn as much as I could. And I, I you know, had it as my topic for, for both of my dissertations for, for urban design and for landscape architecture um, and really sort of delved into um, in the urban environment. And, um, and I'm hoping that tonight I can maybe surprise you. Who knows? Um, so I'm just going to share my screen um, and then... Um, hang on a second. Sorry, I've got PowerPoint issues. Okay. Good. Okay. So, um, I can see the Q and A. If any. Pop a question in. Um, if you can't, let's let's assume that you can. Um, so, uh, I've talked a bit about why for me urban food production is important. Um, and I think, yeah, the challenge of feeding lots of people in a densely populated area, um, I find that quite exciting as a designer. And and I think that there's a lot of different spaces, um, kind of margins and edges. I mean, it's no surprise that we're called edge. So edges are really important in, in design where two landscapes meet, but also edges of buildings, et cetera, um, in an urban environment. Um, and there are lots of spaces that can be explored for, for food production. Um, but, but, but why, food, why urban food production on a, on other levels? So, um, I've sort of summarized the, the why in um in three different categories really so in terms of environmental um these are some of the top reasons um so the existing carbon footprint of food i don't need to convince any of you here tonight that we need to change our food system but um but in terms of food being shipped into cities there is an opportunity there to be reducing our carbon footprint by producing more food closer to where it's consumed um, certainly by having more vegetation, we're helping to reduce the risk of flood, um, very pertinent at the moment. Um, and, um, just, I mean, just purely just increasing vegetation, but why not make it vegetation that's also producing food, um, I guess would be my question. Um, certainly increasing biodiversity, so tree cover, evergreens, shrub cover, et cetera, int introducing more green corridors for small mammals and insects to move around cities. Um, and again, th there's no reason why those can't be edibles. Um, but also by introducing more vegetation into towns and cities, we're, we're creating a cooling effect. And so as our temperatures rise, uh, our urban environments are getting hotter as the sun beats down on buildings and on roads, 
uh, that heat reflected back off just makes our temperatures unbearable in cities often, uh, particularly if the buildings are close together and there's no uh, through draft and, and ventilation of, of through, uh, via wind. Uh, so having vegetation that shades out pavements and roadways um, can have a really beneficial effect, um, but also for buildings as well. Um, so having vegetation somewhere built into buildings um, can really help both keep them warmer in winter and cooler in summer. In terms of social impact, um, it could be that we can help alleviate some food poverty. I'm not suggesting it's a cure-all, um, but certainly by producing more food close to source, we can perhaps reduce the, the price of that food. Um, and by having more food available, hopefully it starts to um, reduce, that, um, reduce that price a bit um, and to make more food surplus available. Um, that can potentially go into food banks um, and you know by potentially having food growing in public spaces that's food that can potentially feed into a food bank um, and on the second part of this webinar I'm going to be so today we're looking at small scale and, and kind of expanding bigger um, on this on the part two I'm going to be looking at larger scale and on that I'm going to be talking about food in public spaces so uh, um, if you're particularly interested in that, there's a couple of really nice case studies of, of different cities across the world that are already doing that and thinking about um, how they can supply into food banks, which I think is, is a really interesting um, scenario. Um, now, crime is a, is a bit of a tricky one, and, and it's one that's quite hard to prove, but um, Incredible Edible Todmorden, which is where Incredible Edible started, um, one of their... Um, sort of loose claims um, is that uh, the crime rate across the town has gone down. And of course, there are lots of issues wrapped up in that, that, that you know, tonight isn't the place for that. But but have, certainly having more interaction between uh, people and communities, bringing people together around food, um, getting neighbourhoods to know each other and know each other's faces can have a knock-on effect of reducing crime in itself, um, which, you know, is in effect social cohesion. And I'm sure we all know about the physical and mental health of, of uh, growing food. And then lastly, but for me, one of the most important economically. Um, so, again, I use Todmorden quite a lot as an example. Now, just to um, just so you know, I lived in Todmorden for five years. So um, it, it was a little while ago now, but but it was whilst the Incredible Edible project was going and I was involved in the project and I feel it, it has a very um, big place in my heart. Um, I loved living there and I, and I loved the people that were there. And um, I think the project's amazing. And I think the impact that it's had on the town is, is super amazing. So I will talk about that quite a bit, but one of the things I think they've done really well is, is affected their local economy. And doing that through a local food system is really exciting. Um, for Todmorden certainly, and for other places across the world, developing some kind of food culture slash ecotourism is entirely possible um, and inviting people into the area because of food um, you know and again it's something that I talk about on urban design because if you're creating a real nice food link or food heritage um, so for example in Oxford uh, horseradish used to be grown a lot because it's very clay soil so you know horseradish grows really well in clay soil um, it's floodplain and so Oxford horseradish cream was a product that was produced and made and sold in, in Oxford. Um, similarly, marmalade, um, Oxford marmalade. So wherever you are, there will be some kind of food history. Um, and, uh, you know, linking to that food history can be really nice and, and it can create a real food culture around a place. Um, and, and in terms of economics, you know, you can be supporting microenterprise. And again, that's something I'll talk about um, when we get to Todmorden. But um, lots of small local producers and suppliers is a much stronger system than than one big supplier as I'm sure we all know I don't need to convince you um so hopefully that's kind of a, a whistle stop tour of, of why I think urban food production is important and plays a role as part of our, our future food solution um just to summarize then so uh currently so a lot of this is based on Oxford I lived in Oxford for for many many years I live just outside it now but it's um it's quite useful for me as a case study because it's it's a city but it's quite a small city um so at the moment most cities will look like this all the energy comes in seeds plants come in compost comes in um and for Oxford it's 99% of its food 
So for Oxford, the statistic is only 1% of Oxford's food uh, comes from the county of Oxfordshire, which I just think is abysmal, especially given that Oxfordshire is quite rural as a county. So, um, you know, you, you sort of extrapolate that out to, to all the other cities, which are probably similar statistics, although I'm sure it will vary. Um, and, and all that food's got to come in from somewhere. Um, and then everything that's going out of the city is all of our waste um, to be processed elsewhere. Um, and, and most of our produce and products are going elsewhere and being sold elsewhere. Um, so what could that look like? Um, I think if we had a lot more food production within a city, it could look a lot like this. Um, so the things coming in is, is potentially extra, extra labour, creating jobs, um, food tourists or visitors, as previously mentioned. Now, the food production I'm talking about doesn't generally include cereal, um, you know, grain crops, um, and it doesn't include dairy because of the land space needed. Um, and this isn't, uh, this is a, you know, I'm talking about systems that incorporate livestock. So um, uh, obviously, you know, adapt it for for however you, you want to. If, if you're looking at a vegetarian system or a vegan system, you, you, you just adapt it to suit you. Um, and then the outputs that can come out of that is um, training and upskilling, replication of a model happy people um you know and and of course the knock on is is um is uh, reduced healthcare costs because we've got happier and healthier people which we all know that can help uh, contribute to reduced healthcare costs so i've summarized it in this but i'm not going to spend too much time on this i've talked about a lot of the things um but it will obviously be in the recording so um if you're you know, watching the recording, you can pause it and enjoy it. But um, this was this was just part of my work to try and kind of brain dump everything that I thought was a benefit to urban food production uh, into one diagram. OK, so I've ruled out dairy and I've ruled out grain crops. Um, so what does that leave? Well, I think there's quite a lot of options for producing within a city. Uh, so this is my list. Um, I'm not going to read it out one, one for one, but you've got your obvious fruits, veg, herbs, uh, nuts, real potential for nuts in terms of their protein source, but also their energy source. Um, so sweet chestnuts, um, beet, white rice and potatoes by weight for calorie. Um, so really good for as an energy source. Um, and of course, with sweet chestnut, you can turn it into a flour. Um, you know, you can turn it into a pate there's lot it's quite a versatile crop um there's lots that can be done with it and i think that's for me that's quite exciting um yeah bee products grazing birds um some you know um fowl really yeah small small livestock um rabbit meat i mean i really like rabbit meat um i think it's 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 really tasty um it's often killed and not eaten so there's an argument there for you know it's a waste product um and it's much more nutritious than something like chicken um dye plants medicinal plants um teas and coffees um yeah i can talk about that more if people are interested um and timber products um so lots of potential for what we could be producing within our immediate vicinity of, of towns and cities so not, not just food but also supporting products as well so I'm going to start with the building scale. Um, anybody who's a, an urban designer, a town planner or a landscape architect will know that the, the, the city, towns and cities have kind of arranged in what's called morphological layers. So that's kind of how I'm going to work. But um, for the lay person, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to start with the building scale and then I'm going to get bigger, basically. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with balconies. Balconies can be extremely important spaces um, for individuals, for families, uh, for learning. Um, but also for food production. Um, and I think they're great potential spaces for food production. And uh, Mark Ridstill smith who's, who, who runs Vertical Veg, which is um, an online uh, blog and website, really, really good, um, showed that with his balcony in London. Uh, so this was a north-facing north balcony, um, only about five metres squared. Um, and he, grow, he grew mostly annuals in pots, and you can see it's quite a lot. <laughs> um, I believe that he also had a wormery and a water butt um, on that, in that space as well. Um, so, you know, trying to be as self-sufficient as possible. Um, so it just goes to show, you know, using every little bit of space available can produce an awful lot of food. So um, my understanding is that he was 
able to supply an awful lot of fresh fruit, um, maybe not so much fruit, but veg in, and salad into his household um, just from that balcony. So, you know, a bit of clever design um, using all the 3D shelves, extra shelves, climbing, climbing plants, etc. cetera. Um, lots of potential there to use balconies for food production. Um, and this is one of my favourite examples. So this is the Bosco Verticale building in Milan. If you haven't seen them before, it's two tower blocks and they've been completely greened around the outside using the balconies to plant trees and shrubs. Personally, I think they're quite beautiful. Um, if you look at the, the skyline of Milan now, they really stand out. Um, and, you know, the benefits of them um, will be will be multifold. So. Um, I've, I've done this sort of summary table uh, for a few of the food production systems that I'm going to be talking about um, and I've categorised them how I started, so social, environmental and economic. Um, so these are balconies on, on residential flats and uh, they can provide spaces for, for you know, social space and, and for learning. Um, so my understanding is that this vegetation is not particularly edible, it's not designed for food production but there is no reason why it couldn't be designed for food production. So if you think about any of the tower blocks near you, what would that look like? You know, if it was greened like this um, and, and it was for food production. So, you know, amazing potential for, for producing food um, in the 3D and using very little ground space because you're, you're going vertically. Um, so the vegetation will be supporting biodiversity in that area, birds, insects, et cetera. Um, and it will be helping clean the air. So through the transpiration of the plants um, and, and the intake of, of carbon dioxide and the, and the breathing out of oxygen, you know, really helping clean that air in a city. Um, potentially supporting a household with with uh, with fresh food um, if if the spaces were planted up with with edibles. Um, and, you know, the opportunity for people to learn about growing food. So, you know, learning another skill that they can then go and potentially earn money for. Uh, rooftops um yeah another really underutilized space in in our urban environments so i've got a few examples here um top left is in new york it's called brooklyn grange farm and, and um that is a csa as far as i understand csa veg enterprise um so supplying veg to its members it's quite a large roof space i don't know off the top of my head how big it is but but you can see that it's quite big um, and then bottom left is the Risk building in Reading. Um, so anybody in the south of England um, might, might have heard of it. It's a forest garden on a rooftop in only a foot of soil, which I think is very impressive. Um, and that uh, foot of soil was dictated because it's a flat roof. And so that was calculated by the engineers as to how much weight could be held on the roof. Um, but it was a flat roof that was leaking. Um, and they needed a solution to it. It's about 20 years old now. Um, and you can see it's it's a social space, it's used for food production and it's used for training. Um, so a really, really lovely space right in the middle of Reading. Um, it's not open to the public, but I believe they do open days. So if you want to go and see one um, like that, then, uh, then check out the website. Uh, the middle bottom one is in Munich in Germany. Um, it's quite a small rooftop example, um, but it's used as an educational resource so that you can see there's a few sheep there um there are bees and chickens also up on the roof um and it's used for visiting school children to learn in a city about you know food production and animals etc so i think that's a really nice social project um and then the right hand right hand picture is in uh, new york and i'm going to talk a little bit more about that one because i think it's really interesting so this is a greenhouse on a roof of a bakery. Um, Elisabar, uh, quite a well-known kind of uh, bakery chain. So he, he has um, he started as a baker and then he's expanded out. He's got restaurants, cafes, um, and and bakery sort of shops you know, across New York. Um, and decided to build this greenhouse on the roof of this building that he acquired for his bakery. And uh, used it to pump the waste heat from his bakery up to the roof into the greenhouse, which I just think is genius. And it's so simple. It's such a simple solution, um, but it's such a great one. So now the, the, the waste heat from his bakery 
supplies the heat for growing um you know seasonal out, out of season produce um year round salad crops for his sandwiches in his delis um and as far as i understand it fruit for making jams for his products like donuts so so the jam that goes into his donuts Nuts. it's all grown on the rooftop of his own bakery which i just think is great um so in terms of a sort of closed loop system um that's the kind of thing that gets me really excited because it's it's creating no waste or it's reusing waste um and yeah i just love using it as an example uh, so this was a conceptual um design that i did as part of my studies um and i just i've picked out a few of the images because i thought they were quite good examples of of kind of what can can happen in a space so um i've got a couple of rooftops here on 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 tower blocks um and on one i've managed to put two aquaponic greenhouses um and some pepper trees and then that shows you what what's been produced um and on the other rooftop um one aquaponic greenhouse and seven hibiscus trees for um tea production um, and then it's just showing you the yield there. So that's coming out of the aquaponic greenhouse. And I'm going to talk about aquaponics in a little bit. Uh, this is another of the rooftops within that scheme. Um, so I put 72 chickens on the rooftop. It's quite a large rooftop. Um, 72 chickens in a woodland rooftop. Um, so again, in the style of the risk uh, rooftop forest garden woodland trees so that the chickens have something to to graze under um and 72 chickens um producing roughly 18,000 eggs in a year um so you know just on one rooftop that's an awful lot of eggs being produced um and a great use of space that is otherwise unused in an urban environment um and then a, another similar one but that's got a larger larger um aquaponic um greenhouse on it plus some veg beds on the rooftop with some trees that go around the outside um so this was based in hong kong which is why the species might look a little bit different so like the nanking cherry um but yeah so slightly different climate but um but this was this was a conceptual design of two blocks for hong kong um in terms of rooftop exam um, examples then this canary wharf rooftop garden i really like it i've visited it in london um it's a really beautiful geodesic um dome sort of timber construction um and it's a garden kind of semi inside so what i really like about it is this red triangle that i've highlighted um is has no glass in that bit so certain sections of the dome have no glass. And what that means is that birds and insects can come in and out of the garden. And for me, that's a really nice, unique feature. Um, and, and having been in there, it, the space feels really nice. It's obviously slightly warmer than outside. Um, it's got a really nice kind of natural feel to it. Um, excuse me, it's not naturally ventilated. It's just, just those kind of free windows. Um, and, and because nature's coming in and out, it really feels like you're connected to the outdoors, but you're still in a covered space. Um, it's mostly non-edible. I think it's, it's you know, m more of a sort of, uh, you know, social space than a than a practical food production garden. Um, but again, there's no reason why it couldn't be mostly food production. There are there were a few that I found in there. So um, the right hand picture is a strawberry tree, um, one of my favourite productive evergreens. Um, produces a fruit that's that's used um in spain to to make a an alcoholic spirit um but it's a lovely evergreen tree um and i think i saw a pepper tree in there as well so there were there are a couple of edibles but but predominantly non-edible okay living walls uh, a couple of examples here from within the uk um so the top ones at birmingham New Street uh, train station, you may have seen it in front of that space age looking building um, and the bottom one is in King's Cross in London. I really like both of those examples. Um, now living walls, you know, they're a bit of a double edged sword and uh, quite often they don't survive because irrigating them is quite a, an, an issue. It's a problem um, because you're dealing with a growing space that's vertical. It's quite hard to reach all of the plants equally with irrigation um it needs proper investment in the right irrigation system um quite often the ones at the bottom will get really wet and some at the top will get missed um but choosing the right plants um and i think you know for me there's potential for herb production etc um so i've summarized 
in one of my tables here. Um, so yeah, greening a public space, I think they look really nice um, when done right, you know, and they, they look uh, really beautiful. It's giving a feeling of access to nature and greenery um, in, in that space, obviously supporting biodiversity through vegetation and, and again, cleaning the air. Um, they, you know, green infrastructure can really improve the um, capital of an area. Um, and, and I think, you know, as a, as a potential food production system for herbs, I think they're great um, and, and actually really great for herbs because herbs don't need a lot of irrigating. So you're kind of you're, the, the problem is the solution there. You know, if you can't irrigate it properly, choose something that doesn't need a lot of irrigating. Um, and then I took the idea from the Bosco Verticale buildings onto this conceptual design that I did. You could see it, it's um, it looks very similar on the outside. And through these two tower blocks managed to create over five and a half thousand square meters of veg vegetation. Um, so you can see the kind of impact that this, this could start to have in terms of both food production, but also in terms of the vegetation that's created in our cities, just by greening the outside of our buildings. Um, and as I said at the top of the presentation, it can have a huge impact on the insulation of a building. Um, you know, both uh, living walls, green roofs um, and green balconies, um, it's all providing an extra layer of armour around the, the edge of that building. Um, so creating an extra layer of insulation can be really beneficial um, and reduce the energy costs inside, either for heating or for aircon. Another of my favourite examples, so this um, Park Royal Hotel is in Singapore and um, on the outside of the building they've managed to create 15,000 square metres of vegetation. Um, I was lucky enough to meet one of the designers that was involved in it um, and it was really interesting hearing about the process. Um, so this was done mainly for aesthetics um, and for biodiversity, so there's quite a lot of uh, regulations and legislation in Singapore about greening buildings and particularly rooftops. Um, so they really, really want to make it a very, very green city. Um, and I just think this is a great example. I think it looks brilliant. Um, again, it's it's creating a feature that people want to come and visit. I'd like to go and stay there. I don't really fly, but I'd love to go and visit it um, uh, because it, it just looks beautiful. Um, so it's, it's making vegetation slash food production a focal point and a, and a talking point and it's bringing people in um connected with that and again there's no reason why that couldn't have been food production um again my understanding is that the vegetation is ornamental rather than food production but there's no reason why it couldn't be you just have to sort out a harvesting <laughs> a harvesting system that could reach all of those uh all of those gardens that are on the edge of the building OK, the Biospheric project um, was in Manchester. It's, it's not running anymore, but it was an interesting example because it used a lot of the inside space of a building. So I just wanted to touch on that because the rooftop was used um, for a poly polytunnel, uh, for chickens, for bees. Um, and then the inside was used for aquaponics, which I am going to talk about. Um, and for mushroom production as well. So the inside space and the outside space of the building were used. Um, and I think, think kind of rethinking how we use our urban spaces, both outside of buildings, but also inside buildings, um, could lead to some really interesting solutions. Um, and this is one of, uh, one example of in London, the Sky Garden. Um, Again, I've visited it, uh, this picture I took from inside. Um, so again, I paid to go and visit because it's a it's an interesting feature. Um, it's on the 38th, 39th floor, so it's quite high up. Um, and you've probably seen the building because it's quite interestingly shaped um, in the skyline of London now. Overlooks the Thames um, and it's got some restaurants and bars inside as, as well in, in on that, that level. Um, but it's it's split level, so you can just kind of walk around and experience the planting. Uh, I'm going to assume that perhaps most people on, on the call might have heard of Bokashi. Um, but for anybody that hasn't, um, it's a it's Japanese for fermentation. It's a fermented uh, composting process. 
it happens anaerobically, so in an airtight container. Um, and the left-hand picture is a picture of a container that you might do Bokashi in. Um, and the idea is that you spend two weeks um, with food waste in a Bokashi system, and then it can go on to a normal composting system. And the benefit of Bokashi is that you can put absolutely any food into it. So meat, fish, bones, uh, bread, citrus, dairy, etc. Uh, so you're not limited to the to the food waste that you would put either into a wormery or into an outside composting system, etc. Um, so I think for me, it's a really exciting solution for food waste within maybe um, apartment buildings, large office buildings, you know, where food collection, food waste collection maybe isn't so possible, but uh, but there could be a Bakashi system and um, it would need designing properly. But but I think yeah i think there's some potential there um and you know there's some really exciting community compost schemes um i know that brighton has done quite a lot of work with with um community compost schemes um as one example but i'm sure there are others in this country um and again community compost schemes you know they bring people together for learning um skill sharing it's it's a community project um it's a chance to meet other people a uh, chance to potentially volunteer and upskill and learn about composting environmentally obviously we're building the soil and we're repurposing the waste nobody wants to see any good nutrients go to waste um we're generating a product um, because the compost uh and and we're building a value in food waste so because we want to use it to create the output of compost food waste becomes valuable um and, and we could be using that as part of a Bakashi system um now then we get on to a slightly challenging topic. Uh, so um, cockroaches and black soldier uh, fly larvae are really, really good at consuming food waste. And I've seen systems where both are used. Um, and then both can be used to feed chickens um, or uh, black soldier fly larvae can be used to uh, feed fish as part of an aquaponic system potentially. And then of course the chickens or the fish can then become part of our food system. Um, and so through our food waste, we are creating more food. We're creating food food for, for uh, creating our food. Um, and I wanted just to talk about this because I think it's quite interesting, but it, it, does, um, it does challenge a few people. So in China, this is a picture of a cockroach farm. Um, and this cockroach farm processes food waste. So a billion, cockroaches can process in theory 55 tons of waste food per day which i just think is amazing um so this is in an area you know china massive massive um food waste coming out of restaurants etc um and you know what a great solution because then the cockroaches either become human food or the cockroaches are fed to chickens and the chicken becomes human food so again for me it's a really nice closed closed loop system but yeah, I get that some people wouldn't be so keen on a cockroach farm. It's it, it is quite um quite out there, I suppose. Uh, but in China, you know, it's it's um certainly becoming more of the norm. Um, and that's what I designed into into this building. So in in my uh, conceptual design, the ground floor of this, with the graffiti around it, was was designed to be a, a cockroach farm for food processing. So um, uh, yeah, so so the cockroaches um, feed either either chickens uh, on the rooftop, or they feed into humans. Um, and you can see that there's a ditch around the outside, um, and that is um, filled with water, and it's purposefully there because if the cockroaches come out, they drown in the in the water. Uh, but there's another reason that water's there. So I really like this as a as a case study. So this uh, village in Japan has water ditches that run around the town and in the ditches are carp fish and carp are really good at eating food waste. So what happens in these uh, in the houses in this uh, village is that the ditches come right through and flow through the kitchens of the houses. And so any food waste generated from cooking thrown directly into the ditch and the carp eat it. And carp are edible. 
they're a bit gritty, but they are edible um, and they are eaten, um, you know, in in, uh, in many cultures in the world. And so, again, what a great what a great way to use food waste um and so bringing water in you know just immediately adds this other potential system to to um to a to a town or a city um so this is just a summary of from that project two blocks um of uh, of buildings and this is a summary of the food that that it that it produced. So uh, I said about the eggs, 420 kilos of fruit, 25,000 kilos of, of veg, 265 nuts, um, and uh, and then the fish there, 1,400 kilos of fish um, from the aquaponic greenhouses. Um, so there is a huge potential to be producing food within our towns and cities. It's just about finding that right space for, to do that. And so as part of that, um, I won't go into too much boring detail, but um, I did create a, a kind of suggested design code for designing food into towns and cities. And for buildings, I uh, came up with these. So um, food production on vertical edges of buildings and balconies, retrofitting um, roofs for food production and or for green roofs, um, both are important. Uh, for food production and for biodiversity um, so it's about choosing the right solution for the right place it doesn't always have to be food production but a green roof would be great for um, flood mitigation and also for biodiversity and then reusing industrial and commercial be um, building heat in rooftop greenhouses so that that's uh, that's the Elisabar New York example so that completes buildings um, and now I'm going to talk to you about what can happen in plots. So plots of land, so it could be the plot of your, your home and your garden. It could be um, the plot of a school and, and the boundary of a school site. It could be the plot of a supermarket and the, and the, the land around a supermarket or a business park. So it's one discrete boundary, really, um, and, and what can happen within that plot. Uh, so... A lot of plots, not all, but a lot of plots have a front garden and usually or often in this country, particularly in towns and cities, that's taken up and used for parking. Um, if it's not parking, it's usually a blank lawn um, that's either cut to within a thread of its life because it's mown too frequently um, or it's um, it's really, really long and weedy. Um, so often front gardens are underutilised. Um, of course, that's a generalisation. Uh, there's a really great campaign. Um, I believe it's US based rather than UK, um, but it's called Food Not Lawns. Um, and I've put the website there if you're interested. But um, I think Food Not Lawns is a really, really good idea and um, and certainly something that I would advocate um, in, in front gardens. And you can see there's there's an example there. And, you know, how much more beautiful and um, biodiverse a space can be when it's producing food rather than just being a lawn. Um, and then back gardens and, uh, you know, not, not everybody um, will have a back garden, but uh, some people will. Um, and there's potential for food production within that space. So whether that be garden beds for vegetables or herbs or, or fruit or nut trees, um, but also there's potential small scale livestock production. So egg production, the birds that I mentioned earlier, so chickens, duck, quail, um, also maybe potentially for rabbit. It's again, a slightly sensitive topic, but um, rab rabbit production for meat. Um, so kind of the smaller, the smaller end of livestock um, for, for meat and egg production. Um, and whenever I'm talking about keeping animals, I'm always talking about the highest possible welfare standards. I'm certainly not advocating anything that is anywhere near industrial production, um, nor any kind of caged production, just to just to make that really clear. So um, yeah, whenever we design livestock into a system, it's, it's always with the highest um, respect and integrity for the animals. Um, I wanted to share this example with you because I, I really like it and, and it's different and it's 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 not mine. Um, so a chap called James West came up with this conceptual design and it's for a terraced house. And I think it was based, I believe, in Bolton. 
um, uh, only because I think they were using that as a as a case study. Um, so it's a terraced house that's been retrofitted for food production and it incorporates a number of really nice systems, I think. So there's a living wall at the front. You can see that the, the driveway has been converted to kind of half turf um, parking space for a, a smart car or electric car. Um, there's also space for food production on half the driveway because the car is smaller. So it means that it's taking up less of the driveway space. Um, there's bicycle storage there. There's um, vertical growing up um, on the outside of the front of the house. But also there's space, I don't know if you can see it at the front of the house, where there's kind of like a an insulated wall inside. Um, so it's kind of like a tiny, tiny mini greenhouse for um, insulated food production. Um, mezzanine floors, um, pigs in the backyard. Now, I wouldn't have that many pigs in that small an area just to just to make that clear. But um, yeah, but, you know, they used to be street pigs in the Second World War. Street pigs were a huge contributor to the food that was consumed by people um, at that time because uh, food waste was fed to pigs and then the pigs were, were killed and shared between the households there. And, you know, if it wasn't for schemes like that, people, more people would have gone hungry in, in, in the world wars. Um, so, you know, pigs are, pigs are great. I, there is legislation now that means you can't feed food waste to them, but there, there's a campaign in London called the Pig Idea, which um, which I believe is trying to overturn that legislation. Um, and then the the um, the basement has been converted to be aquaponic production, so so fish production um, for edible fish. Um, so within one terraced property, I just think it's it's really exciting at how much food potentially has been fitted into this plot. Um, so in, incorporating the front and back gardens and the house itself, you know, immediately you've got a huge amount of food production space. Um, so we need to be thinking outside the box um, and, uh, you know, thinking creatively and thinking of new solutions and just being a bit different, I think, and a bit inventive about where our food could come from. So I've I've kept promising you that I was going to talk about aquaponics and, and here we are. Um, so for anyone that doesn't know what aquaponics is, it's a production system with water and it, um, it incorporates a tank for fish and then it incorporates um, plant growth as well. And the water is cycled between the, the area where the fish are and the area where the plants are. And the idea is that the fish poo feeds the plants and the plant roots filter the water and clean it, remove the poo, use it as fertilizer, and then the water comes back and is clean. So you need a, a pump and a system. Um, and uh, there's a couple of systems here. So there's a, a design at the top, and then the bottom one is from Todmorden, and that is in the high school at Todmorden. Um, and it was set up to give the students a, 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 um, the chance to run that as an enterprise and learn about aquaponics. Um, and then also within um, an aquaponic greenhouse, there is the potential to be grow mushrooms. Now, this isn't a, a mushroom course, so I'm not going to go into the techniques of, of growing mushrooms, although we do produce mushrooms. Um, there, it, it would need to be done in the right way, but there is potential to use greenhouses for mushroom production. Um, and again, really nice relationship there. And I've put some of the um, potential crops um, from that could be produced within an aquaponic group um, greenhouse here. Um, so some of the more tropical crops, particularly if it, if it was a heated greenhouse and it need to need to have some extra heat in there really. Um, but we could be looking at producing a lot more of our tropical crops, watermelons, passion fruit, citrus. Um, we could be having quail in there. Um, you know, they're, they're really used to a, a hotter climate, um, pineapples, turmeric, um, peanuts, etc. So really looking at how we can be producing um more of the crops that we currently import um and actually you know at the moment we import a lot of the, the fruit and veg that would grow here which is frankly ludicrous but that's not for tonight uh so an example of a of a greenhouse which i think 
is is doing really well. I haven't seen it for a couple of years, but Martin Crawford has set up a, a greenhouse um, at one of his sites in Devon, and he set it up to a produce more tropic tropical crops for food security for himself and his family, and b for research. And anybody who knows Martin will know that he's really really hot on research and data um, and recording. And this system that he set up, I think, is just fantastic. Um, uh, so if you're interested, I believe he's still running courses on, on the greenhouse. Um, go and see it. It's got some really interesting plants in there, um, both for food and for medicine, plants I'd never even heard of. Um, really, really interesting. And I think if we if we did go down the route of looking at how we can be more food secure as a country and as a, as a people, you know, certainly some kind of indoor growing would be needed. Um and and it could be really exciting and it could create more jobs um and and it and it creates more of a local food economy um so we could be looking at you know more of our fruits produced um certainly sort of bananas citrus passion fruit you know all of that kind of fruit that we that we import and it, and martin has set up his greenhouse to be very environmentally sensitive so he's i don't know if you can see at the bottom from the picture there there's some tubes um, so it, um, it's got some, you know, uh, very uh, intelligent sensors in it that regulates the heat. Um, so windows are opened if it gets too hot and heat is drawn in from outside if it gets too cold. So it's, it's all done and I believe it's all done with solar. Um, so it doesn't have to be really, really expensive in terms of electricity use. Um, but I think, again, certainly they, they form part of the future super food solution, in my opinion. Now, if we're producing food, um, we definitely want to be looking after the biodiversity, um, uh, mainly because we want to get pollinators in, but also because we want to support biodiversity. Um, and so whilst this is a session on food production, it was just really a nod to say we always need to be thinking about providing that habitat and providing water um, for biodiversity as part of our food production systems. Um, so it's really just a nod to that and thinking about how we integrate that. So for example, I always put a mini pond into my polytunnels. Um, I always plant trees in polytunnels. Um, it's it's part of an ecosystem and what I want to be creating is a whole ecosystem. Um, so that, those are some of the ways that we create an ecosystem and which then helps with, with pests and diseases. Okay, right, sensory gardens, really, really important as part of our growing spaces, um, appealing to other senses, um, certainly for people that might have lost one sense or more. Um, you know, thinking about how can we create really interesting garden and growing spaces using other senses like sound and, and smell and touch um, and, and what plants are going to tick those boxes for us and, and how can that help people. Um, so, you know, yeah, I've summarised here, uh, creating a space for learning and skill sharing, supporting pollinator planting, uh, creating habitat spaces to visit. So it could be um, a respite space. It could be a, a place where people meet, um, supporting differently able people. So, you know, really important places. And it doesn't mean it can't produce food either. Um, you know, I mean, sweet corn sweet corn rustles in the wind and there's some really interesting edibles that we could be incorporating into sensory spaces as well and as part of food production if it's going to be happening in our urban environments we need to be thinking about where it's going to be processed and where it's going to be sold and so for me it needs to inc include some kind of community kitchen space or some kind of shared space that can be food hygiene certified that people can use it small producers can use it or hire it um, for things like making jams chutneys pickles um, maybe smoking making um, wines or juices um, but it's got all of the equipment there um, it's one resource but it's shared between maybe let's say you know 100 different food producers across the city what a great resource and it enables people to add value to their produce um, and then we need to have a system for routes to market. We need to know where that produce is going to get sold. Is it through markets? Is it directly through veg boxes? Is it by wholesalers? What is that mechanism? How does that produce reach the end user? Um, and training. Training is so important. We need to make sure that people have the right skills. Um, you know, I don't know who's on the call tonight in terms of where you're at with your growing journey, but you might be a complete beginner. You might be a 
fully experienced grower been growing for 40 50 years i don't know but you know getting the right information and learning how to grow in the right way being responsible to the environment to biodiversity to our soil health all of those skills are really important um, and so integrating some training within urban food production is is really important because it means people are then going off and replicating the right kind of system um, and so you know so we run um, farm start courses um, and various uh, for exactly that reason because it means people can start their journey off on the right footing and they know you know I know that I'm teaching them the right way that isn't going to waste their time waste their money and it means they can you know very quickly get to a point where they can be making a decent income from growing food um but so it's really important to include that um as a mechanism as part of the urban food production um you know and again what what we're ending up with is skilled growers um and we're creating jobs because we need trainers to train people um we're creating a local economy around food production okay so I've gone through a, quite a number of different food production systems um, and I just wanted to talk about um, how that is potentially distributed because if all of a sudden we decided to start integrating food into all of our cities, at the moment we'd have quite a problem with that because we don't have the systems set up to manage and distribute those uh, food production systems and all of that produce. Um, so the reason that that's really important is somebody has to have responsibility for the space because they need to have insurance. Someone needs to be managing the space, keeping it tidy, keeping on top of it, keeping it repaired. Um, and somebody needs to be harvesting that produce. Otherwise, there's no point if it's just going to waste. So I've created these two diagrams, which are for um, this one is for management models. Um, so there's a number of different options here. Currently, green space in the public realm quite could quite possibly be managed by local authorities. It could be that that continues even if it's food. Um, if it was something like, um, you know, raised beds or uh, a forest garden, it might be really low maintenance, in which case it's actually saving the local authority time. Um, it could be some kind of community um, management through volunteers. It could be a group like Community Payback. Um, etc um it could be a private enterprise um so it could be somebody that decides to set up um there's a lady in todmorden who started to buy the honey from the beehives that were kept in the churchyards in todmorden and make honey flavored ice cream um, and that became her product so she was using a local product to make a local product and sell it locally. Um, so, you know, again, it's using what's available in, in your in your local area. Um, might be some kind of not-for-profit. Uh, so in Oxford, there's an organisation called Aspire, which takes on trainees from, I believe they're recovering addicts, ex-offenders, trains them up with landscape management and then takes on contracts to do landscape management. So again, what a great social project because you're providing service, but you're also providing social benefit. Um, some kind of incredible edible management model. So that's managed by volunteers. Um, and then the last one that I put on here, if anybody saw this program or if they, if you haven't, I would thoroughly recommend it. It was on Channel 4 and it was called Old People's Home for Four-Year-Olds. And it was such a beautiful program. And it paired uh, four-year-olds with uh, older people in, in care homes and they built relationships they did activities together and these were older people who were often confined to a chair not doing a lot and by the end of the series of the of the programs they were up about running about a, an, an obstacle course with their with their four-year-old companion and it was just such a beautiful program. And it just goes to show with, with the right support and with the right company and with the right stimulation, how much more active uh, older people could be and how undervalued they are in our current society. Um, and, you know, the four year olds benefited as well because they had lovely, re lovely relationships. Um, if you haven't seen that program, I would thoroughly recommend it. I think it's a really, really interesting and worthwhile social project. And then we need to be looking about how we're distributing it 
Um, so is it through private enterprise? Is it free to the public? Is it going into supermarkets? Is it going to food banks? Um, Abundance is a volunteer led group uh, where a third goes to the volunteers who harvest it, a third goes to food banks and a third goes to the landowner if it's maybe an older person who has a fruit tree but can't harvest the fruit, uh, for example. So that's a really nice model, really nice social model. Um, or is it going into the local food system via things like farmers markets or co-ops um, or, or some other distribution uh, channel? But it's really important to be thinking about this because if we're suddenly going to have this influx of local produce it needs to reach people somehow um, and one of the reasons that we came up with this um, with this toolkit is to help um, organizations local authorities um, landscape professionals think about all of these things in order to design them into the local infrastructure so if a new housing estate is being de uh, designed or if a new school is being designed or a new retail area um, or a whole new town um, is being designed you know potentially using our toolkit could help them start to think about how they can integrate food into the landscape um, so I mean you know, just to explain how this works so uh, we've got 34 different food production systems in the toolkit um, and this is this is an example card. This is what it looks like. It includes quantity of yield in kilograms. So it helps you decide exactly how much food is going to come out of that, um, what the savings of the system could offer. So it might be a saving on not having to mow a lawn. Um, and then it's got the environmental, social and economic benefits at the bottom. Um, and it, this is an example of one of them, of, of what that looks like. And this is Tree Guild. And I'll be talking about Tree Guilds um, on the part two of this of this uh, webinar series. Um, Lizzie, I think we're we're at eight o'clock. Um, so I'm happy to go with with sort of what, what you think, really, in terms of timing. So we can stop now and do questions um, and I can move on and do streets in the part two. Very happy to do that. Um, I mean, there's there. So, I think if people want to put questions um in the Q and A box um now, uh, then that'd be great. But I I think there's time to do streets. Um, I'd I'd certainly be interested. I'm fascinated so far. So um, if you if you'd like to carry on, then um, okay. okay. Yeah, sure. So carry on for a bit and then maybe stop in 5.10 and, and see if we've had questions in. Yeah. OK, so, um, yeah. So if people want to ask questions, then pop them in the Q&A um, and I'll come to those in a bit. Um, and for now, I will carry on and do a few of the food systems that can happen in our streets. So we've looked at what can happen in buildings in, around, on, um, outside buildings. And we've looked at what can happen within individual plots. So kind of houses, schools, hotels, etc. And, and so we're getting bigger and bigger in the scale of our systems. And now we're going to look at what we could potentially do in our streets. And so I'm going to use um, use some conceptual examples as well as some real life examples to try and demonstrate that for you. Um, so raised beds. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously I had to include Todmorden, didn't I? Um, but uh, so the top picture is... Um, it's it's sort of a mini forest garden actually. Um, got fruit trees, fruit shrubs in their new health centre, or it was it was new at the time anyway. Um, and I think at this point I will just say something about um, pollution because I often get asked about pollution. Um, now this is a bit of a tricky one for me because we're all on here on an organic event, but usually what I say is. If you don't eat entirely organic, you will be eating far worse uh, toxins and chemicals on your food. However, I think tonight the audience is slightly different. Um, but I do usually make the point that um, most vehicles now run on unleaded um, fuel. Uh, so previously lead would have been a, a concern, um, but much less of a concern now. Um, and, you know, yeah, like I say, our, most of our food is produced um, large scale by vehicles um, where there's going to be exhaust fumes thrown out onto the crops uh, and anything that's produced non-organically will of course be sprayed by goodness only knows what uh, so that is usually my answer um, and of course you have to do what you're comfortable with for me 
it doesn't worry, worry me. I'd rather eat something that was grown without spray on chemicals that had been grown in a car park than something that was non-organic. Personally, that's that's just me and that's my my opinion. Obviously, you, you make a decision um, as to uh, what feels right to you. Um, but I think, yeah, I don't have an issue with, with food produced in this way yeah, within our towns and cities. Um, so when this health centre was built, all of the planting around the car park and around the building itself, all of it was edible. And that's something that Todd Modern's done really well is got that into the legislation where um, all planting goes in uh, uh, at the start to be edible, uh, which is obviously a great thing. Um, and then the bottom left picture is from outside the police station. Um, it's a raised bed with vegetables growing in it. Um, so the raised beds around the town are managed by volunteer sessions um and at the last count i think they were having about 50 volunteers turn up for their sessions which is enormously successful um and uh, as far as i am aware they still run them on the first and the third sundays of the month um but i do know that when the police station got their raised beds the fire station piped up and went hang on we want some too um so you know it really spread the idea really spread around the town um, and, uh, you know, has become extremely successful at growing food right there in, in the public realm and in front of people's, um, you know, in their faces. So you just can't ignore food production there, um, which is, is obviously having a huge impact across the town. Um, and then uh, the bottom right one is is a picture from Vienna. Um, and, and, you know, really, I've put it in. This is not so much food production um but this space is making these people really happy um it looks beautiful and it's additional planting at the base of a tree um where otherwise it might just be a metal grill around that tree with nothing else there but it's creating a haven for wildlife um it's creating flowers for pollinators um and it's created a really nice space that people can can walk past and, and hopefully make some smiles so you know it doesn't have to be a big area it doesn't have to be a big raised bed to have a benefit um, and here is my incredible edible Todmorden um, summary and case study. Uh, so this is one of their sort of meanwhile growing spaces in the centre of the town, um, set up with raised beds, uh, mini polytunnel, etc. And as you can see, it's well used. Um, so Todmorden, um, yeah, on the border between Lancashire and West, West Yorkshire, um, ex-milling town, previously massive and employment um you know in, the incredible edible movement has had a massive impact on the economy of that town um it's really created a value around local food it's championed local produce and local produce so people are seeking it and want to support local producers um and um yeah i mean i can't really say much more than that but, um I, I think i've said it all but um but but from living there it really is in the bones of that place now. And, and it's it's a fantastic example of how food can change the destiny of, of a place. Um, and now, you know, it it, um, it generates what they call vegetable tourists um, that come, come and visit the town. Um, it's created, you know, a food culture. There's more cafes and restaurants opening up. There's more food producers like the, the lady with the ice cream that I mentioned. Um, and and because people are coming to visit it, there's money coming into the town. There's people staying in B and Bs and guest houses. Um, so it's really created an economy around the town, which is just genius. It's just genius. And you know, props to to Pam and and um, and Mary and Estelle, who who you know were the original founders. Um, you know, three fantastic women. Um, ju just a genius idea. Um, you know, they really go down in history. I think just such a fantastic uh, scheme. That's that spread around the world um so larger than raised beds then hedgerows um really really important for biodiversity uh but also really, really useful for our food production um so i've put fruit and nuts and berries there because we could be using our hedgerows much more for productive species for us um but there are also many hedgerow species that are edible so beech leaves are edible uh, lime tree leaves are edible of course, we get blackberries growing growing in our hedgerows, which are are edible. Um, but crab apple, hazelnut, um, um, cherry. Um, there are so many species that grow well in a in a in a hedgerow that we could be 
designing in much more um, than we do at the moment. Hawthorn berries are edible. Um, and there's a ma massive market for hawthorn berries in China, actually, because they use them for a beverage, uh, for a soft drink um, that sells what there. So, you know, there's huge potential for hedgerow produce, um, slows for slow gin, etc. Um, and really just to just to put in another vote for um, wildlife habitat in the form of, of hedgerows, but also in, in form of uh, evergreens. Um, so making sure that systems have a, a good um, level of, of evergreens that can provide that year round shelter for birds, um, for small mammals, hedgehogs, etc. Um, and, and those really important green corridors. Um, so hedgerows, you know, they're, they're no good if they're leggy and there's nothing at the bottom. But I've, I've included these as examples because I think they're quite good examples of the hedge going right to the ground, which is really important for mammals, you know, um, voles, shrews, mice, um, hedgehogs, etc. that need that cover at the ground level, um, because otherwise the, it's not a green corridor for them. It's, it's only going to work for birds. Um, uh, and supporting them, you know, through bug hotels and, and um, you know, bee hotels and things like that. Um, so habitat, uh, artificial habitat, um, as well as natural habitat. And then creating things like this um, hibernacular, so hibernating spaces for various different species. Um, I've included this one. Uh, so this is actually a still from a Jeff Lawton video from, from YouTube. Um, it's a great video. Um, it's it's about a, a housing development in in Davis in California. Um, it's an intentional community of two hundred and seventy three houses on sixty acres. So, yeah, not overly not overly dense really, but but for um, for private housing, I suppose, and detached housing, it's 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 moving towards slightly more dense. Um, all of the landscape and the public realm is planted up with edible um, plants and I, I guess sort of forest garden style planting. Um, and it's a really good example, in my opinion, of, of what public realm planting could look like if it's if it's all edible. Um, so that's a really nice example that I like using. Um, OK, so uh, the last one that I've included for tonight is rain gardens. Um, and you can see from from the picture on the right, they can look absolutely beautiful, um, but they're they're essentially water catchment gardens. Um, so in times of high rainfall, they can take that overflow um, and absorb it. Um, they're usually um, slightly uh, hollowed out pieces of ground so the water can can go into something. Um, and then the planting is, of course, planting that can cope with with uh, the wet conditions. Um, and, you know, on the side of streets, uh, as part of um, street furniture, they can be incredibly useful for, um, uh, you know, various benefits such as um, slowing down traffic, um, greening the streets, uh, increasing water runoff from hard standing um, and also from cleaning the air. So if, if they're on a street side, they're, they're of course, going to absorb some of that. Um, some of that pollution and you know they can be really beautiful spaces as well there we are so that's a, a very very whistle stop tour of some of the food production systems that could happen in our cities um, so I'll put up our socials if you want to get in touch um, and I'll, I'll pass it over to to, uh, to Lizzie for um, for questions um, okay so we've got a question in um, it's about the viability of rooftop farms and trees on the roof. Um, does it require a lot of load bearing? Um, yeah, I mean, so the um, the example that I used in in rooftop was uh, was the well, one of them was the risk building in Reading, and as I say, it was done as part of a roof repair anyway. Um, so. Uh, it was a flat roof that was leaking. And so they were going to have to repair the roof and re-engineer it to some extent anyway. And so they decided at that point that they would um, increase the load bearing capacity to enable them to put on a, a, a garden up, up there on the, on the flat roof. Um, and the reason why it's only a foot of soil is because of course, the more soil you have, the more heavy it is, but also then the more water it can hold. So you're kind of doubling the amount of extra weight that goes on there. Um, so that level of, of one foot of soil 
just limits the amount of, of weight through water absorption as well as through the soil itself. Um, so, I, yeah, I'm not an engineer and, and you'd need to get proper engineer help um, and, and support to, to look at a roof. But, um, yeah, the, the, the best advice I can give you is definitely get proper professional advice because, yeah, um, roofs, you can't mess around with roofs and you don't want your roof falling in. So, um, yeah, definitely be looking at some proper advice for that. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, there's no, uh, my, sorry, my, also my laptop just decided to suddenly die um, about two minutes ago. So uh, I don't think I missed much, but um, hopefully the recording will still be uh, good. But um, yeah, yeah there's no cool. questions in the chat, but I have, I had a couple of questions um, that I'd like to ask actually. Um, one, I guess, given that um, this is a, um, you know you're doing this with the organic growers alliance um i wondered if you could talk a little bit more about um the the maybe the difficult if you know i don't know i don't know how much you know about this um but the difficulties around organic certification with certain systems that might lend themselves better to urban spaces um like for example hydroponics i know that there's a big debate at the moment going on um and some pushing to let hydroponics in certification um which you know I'd, like i'm speaking f um for myself and not necessarily completely officially oga but um also know that it's not something that we would want to be let in um aquaponics different obviously because it's kind of like a um a whole kind of closed system but i don't know if you have any anything um to to talk about regarding yeah organic certification in urban environments um yeah so so the first thing i want to say is that often vertical farms are um spouted as as part of the solution to to our future food um and i i strongly disagree with that because vertical farms like you say you know it's hydroponics it's not a closed loop system it's often he heavily reliant on inputs of water and nutrients in large volumes and it's reliant on electricity for artificial light um so that's certainly not what i'm advocating as part of urban food production um and it won't it won't be in any of my any of my presentations for that reason yeah i like um aquaponics for in terms of a closed loop system I wouldn't have an issue with that um, being included in certification because, like you say, because of the closed loop system of it, as long as the fish are treated with respect. Now, that there's a lot of aquaponic systems that are, I think, slightly dodgy in the space that the fish have. Um, and I think, you know, as I say, we always advocate high welfare standards and, and that, that would need to be looked at. And I think that is potentially something that could be sort of set in stone in terms of, yeah, number of fish per space type scenario um for welfare um but it's it's the fish poo that's feeding the plants and so if the fish are, are treated in an organic way i don't have an issue with that you know falling under certification um in terms of what systems could work well um i think anything that's either sort of in an in a in an enclosed space like an aquaponic greenhouse and or something that's on maybe a rooftop it's far enough away from, you know, outside sort of pollutants. Um, you know, I get the traffic thing. I, I totally get it. It doesn't bother me, but, you know, I get that it's going to bother some people. Um, and therefore something like a rain garden or roadside raised beds, you know, might be a slightly um, grey area for, uh, you know, for um, clean plants. Um, but certainly sort of rooftop, rooftop growing, if it's far enough away from the street, um and or something in an enclosed growing space i think yeah personally i, I, th I think that would they, they would both be good shouts i don't know if that answers your question yeah no it's it's a really good um beginning to the exploration of it i think um yeah there's there's definitely kind of uh space for for looking into it more and and seeing how we can kind of as the oga like promote urban organic um growing and and how that might how we can help at least with the certification um 
because yeah I think I guess it's it's um urban organic growing seems to you know lend itself quite well to volunteer projects as well so um organic certification isn't always like the most viable option for like volunteer and kind of charity groups but um obviously we want we want everyone to be certified or not necessarily certified but practicing at least um yeah it is a tricky one isn't it but yeah like you say that the sort of volunteer aspect adds another layer to it, it it's an interesting topic isn't it and it's it's not something we're going to solve in the next 10 minutes but 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 I think yeah there's lots of kind of param different parameters and, and layers to it that need kind of unpicking a bit really yeah absolutely um but we're here for the conversation for sure um <laughs> I have a I have another question but I don't know if anyone else wants to ask anything and um, nothing's come up in the chat yet but um I'll leave it open for a few minutes. Um, it was more around kind of if you could, I don't know if you're going to be covering this in the second part, so feel free to ignore, um, but just more around like, um, I guess like policy in, in you've touched on it for sure, but like um, I'm thinking more of particularly like I mentioned earlier, um, the incredible edible right to food campaign that they did up in Hull. Um, which you probably know way more about than me, so you might want to explain what that is. But um, yeah, looking at um, you know, the access to land in in cities is um, is sometimes more complicated than just accessing kind of bare arable land in in rural areas. And maybe you could touch on that a little bit more. And yeah. Yeah, um, I'm very happy to answer now, but but also I will look at putting some of that in, into the into the part two. Um, so certainly legislation wise, there are a number of kind of case study cities that have developed some legislation that supports urban agriculture. Um, there are also some bits of legislation that um, prohibits or prevents it. Um, so I'm happy to to do a bit on that in, in part two. Um, I think just in terms of, sort of Todmorden, I think what 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 they did so well was kind of pave the way for other kind of legislation and things that came after them. Um, and the first thing that they did was through Calderdale Council was um, approve the use of council land for growing food, you know, before anyone had even thought about that. Um, so a, a mechanism for people to contact their local authority and say, I've seen this piece of land. A, is it council owned? And B, please can I use it for growing food? Um, and what they've been really good at around the town of Todmorden is using those meanwhile spaces, you know, that are potentially waiting for development or whatever to use as temporary growing, growing food uh, spaces. Um, so they've really paved the way for that and sort of started that conversation, um, you know, and, and, and massive respect to them for doing that. Um, and yes, the, the right to grow campaign. Um, yeah, again, happy to to put something about that next time. But um, but yeah, so that that I think that sort of was born out of that legislation that came with Calderdale Council. And it's like, well, actually, maybe we should make this a national policy where everybody has the right to grow and they can contact their council. And it's like, yeah, what if we what if we rolled that out and what would that look like? Um, so um uh yes, I will include some legislation bits in the next one. Brilliant. Um, also, yeah, sorry, I called it completely the wrong thing. I have it in my head. I kept trying to, yeah, <laughs> but it's not the right to food, it's the right to grow. Um, <laughs> great. Well, uh, that's all of my questions. You you did a thorough job of um, answering all, all the questions that came up in my head um, as you talked. And um, yeah, I oh, really good. enjoyed that. And um, I hope everyone else did. Uh, yeah, if there's no more questions, then I think we'll... we'll wrap up and we can go and grab a glass of something or a cup of something um, yeah yeah but yeah just wanted to say thank you so much for that that was um really fascinating and like I said at the beginning really something that I think the OGA want to look at more is urban um organic food production and we're very much looking forward to the second part I am at least um 18th of April same time seven till 8 30 p.m um yeah thank you Lovely. Yeah, well, nice to see you, um, uh, Lizzie. And um, yeah, I haven't seen anyone else, but nice to see some names on. And um, yeah, thank you so much for coming. So I uh, hope to see some of the uh, some, um, people along for the next time. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone.